Okay, uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the uh, fourth meeting in 2015 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Can I welcome uh, members, welcome our witnesses, who I'll introduce shortly, and those joining us in the gallery. And can I remind everyone, please, to turn off or at least turn to silent all mobile phones and other uh, electronic devices so they don't interfere with the committee's work. Uh, item uh, one uh, on the agenda, uh, we are continuing our uh, inquiry into the economic impact of the creative industries. And I'd like to welcome uh, this morning joining us from the uh, Scottish Government, we have Fiona Hislop, who's the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Europe and External Affairs, uh, John Swinney, Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and the Economy. And they're joined by uh, Stephanie uh, Zimber, who is Senior Policy Officer at Creative Industries, and Michelle Campbell, uh, Team Leader, Media and Creative Industries. Welcome to you all. Uh, before we get into questions, uh, Fiona Hislop, do you want to say something by way of an introductory statement? Just very briefly, Convener, I, I'd just like to say how much I, I welcome the committee putting a spotlight on Creative Industries. It's uh, one of our key sectors. Uh, it employs uh, more people than oil and gas. It contributes more to uh, gross value added in the economy than life sciences. And as I set out my written evidence, uh, it covers a range of areas uh, very important to the economy um, and in, in terms of the value it adds um, to our interest there. But the one thing to particularly stress, and I think it may have come through in the evidence you have, you can't build a successful creative industry sector unless you have a strong and vibrant cultural sector more generally. Um, that really is the lifeblood of the creativity that can then find expression in a whole range of the different sectors that you've been examining. Uh, obviously, you've been focusing particular, in particular areas, but if you look at the areas, whether it's architecture or fashion or design um, in terms of crafts, and a whole range of areas and IT, uh, museums, galleries, and also in the music industry. Scotland is in a strong place in the cultural sense, and obviously the opportunities for industry to grow is really important. And I, I do think the efforts from the committee to, uh, not least with your showcase that you uh, hosted here at the Parliament, was a good example of making sure that there's a greater awareness of that area and its contribution to the economy. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we got about 90 minutes, I know you need to be away by, by 11.30, so we have about 90 minutes for this session, and there's, there's a range of areas I think members will want to, to cover. Um, I would ask members if they can keep their, their questions short and to the point, and uh, answer similarly short and, and to the point will allow us to get through the, the topics in the time uh, available. Uh, can I maybe just start by just maybe giving a very brief summary where I think we've got to with, with the evidence, because we heard from three uh, specific sectors, one was, was uh, games, one was TV, and one was film. Now, clearly, there was quite an overlap in terms of the interest, but you know, to try and characterise the evidence we heard, I would say the games industry has challenges, but is generally, I think, quite optimistic in terms of its outlook. I think in relation to, to television, I think there are challenges in television, uh, but probably the most serious uh, issues we heard were in relation to film. And we heard quite a lot of concern from people in the film sector, including many film producers, about what they felt was a, a lack of... Uh, uh, a joined-up approach from uh, public bodies like Creative Scotland and Scottish Enterprise. In fact, you know, one person who gave us evidence said he thought the relationship between Creative Scotland and Scottish Enterprise was like a failing marriage. And we also heard quite a lot about what they felt was a lack of public sector leadership in relation to uh, this policy area. Maybe I could ask you first, um, Ms Hislop, I mean, did this come as a surprise to you, this evidence? Well... In a sense, there's been a, a development of the relationship since the establishment of Creative Scotland as a new body uh, with uh, Scottish Enterprise. In terms of the challenges and issues, you see the challenges of working across different sectors, not just in, in creative industries, but obviously there are other key sectors, food and drink, life sciences, energy, and you'll see the relationships of the supply of support from a range of public services. Um, and the key is how you can respond to industry needs. Now, one of the things that uh, was established was the Scottish Creative Industries Partnership, which brought together not just Scottish Enterprise and Creative Scotland, but there's also other players here. Scottish Funding Council, if you think about the investment, for example, in the University of Aberdeen for computer gaming, you heard obviously a lot of evidence about the importance of skills and investment there. Skills Development Scotland, who are, are developing the Skills Investment Plan for Creative Industries. So they're not just a relationship that's important between Creative Scotland and Scottish Enterprise. There are other sector uh, interests as well. And the important thing for all of us is to make sure that they're marshaled, coordinated and facing the response from, from whatever sector they're dealing with. And obviously in creative industries, as I explained,
explain there's a range of different areas um, but obviously I, I recognise that the challenges particularly in the, and indeed the opportunities and the ambition for the film sector and that's why we're making sure that across whether it's ministerial portfolios but also public agency they have to work well and work well together. Okay, so, so, so you, you recognise the challenges, so I take it from that, so, some of what we've heard didn't come as a surprise to you. So what are you now doing to take this forward? Well, part, part of that is the uh, important work of the Creative Industries Partnership, making sure this, uh, you know, the, in terms of skills development, there's uh, support. That's why that plan's coming forward from Skills Development Scotland, working with all the agencies. Uh, yesterday I announced uh, £1 million of development funding. One of the, to, make, to give you an example in terms of our support, the development funding will be administered by Creative Scotland, but obviously heavily influenced and informed by the Creative Industries Skills Plan that's been put together by Skills Development Scotland. Uh, production is a challenge. Uh, we know that we want to get more investment into actual production. The announcement I made uh, yesterday of £2 million of a loan fund is to help with uh, the cash flow in terms of production so that they can maximise the uh, tax credits available from the UK government. Again, a big incentive that has just been delivered, so that's a, a welcome development. But again, that will help the production side. It's not the, the end of the journey. It's certainly a significant contribution. And the third element is obviously on the studio and there's very active involvement and engagement um, even as we speak and I set up the film uh, studio delivery group which brought together uh, uh, Creative Scotland and uh, Scottish Enterprise to work more closely together particularly to, de to deliver in that area so that's an example of where uh, agencies are working together I think the test will be on the delivery and I think that's what obviously people are interested in and in the different sectors within creative industries, we're probably at different stages of how that contribution is being made, as you've seen and evidenced in your own evidence, the difference between the gaming sector, for example, and the film and television that you've just identified. I don't know if John, you want to... I think uh, what I'd add to, to what Carmen said, you said is that the, you know, the, the support that individual sectors of the economy require um, in, in, in the, the very complex world in which we occupy... Uh, will very rarely come from one particular organisation. If we look at any sector of the economy, there will be um, skills development requirements, there will be business development requirements, and there will be particular sectoral development requirements within that area. So, you know, if, if we leave the creative industries for a second and go to um, the food and drink sector, for example, there will be business development requirements that will be provided by Scottish Enterprise, there will be um, skills development requirements provided by um, skills Development Scotland, and there will be particular um, technological and product development solutions that will be provided by um, agencies of government or alternatively by higher or further education institutions and other research institutions. So is, that example, I think, illustrates that what we have to make sure is that we draw together all of that expertise to make it available to those individual sectors. And that's what lies at the heart of what... Um, we uh, we try to do in each individual sector um, and to make sure that sectors are properly and fully supported and have access to the range of skills and expertise that can, able, can enable them to realise their full potential. And in the creative industry sector, um, you have Creative Scotland providing essentially the creative development element or well, supporting the, the creative development process You've got Scottish Enterprise de delivering the business development process and Skills Development Scotland supporting in the development of skills. And uh, some of that will apply, you know, for example, in the creative industries, uh, in the gaming sector, the very close proximity that a number of companies have with academic institutions uh, provide them with a very direct channel of taking forward their, um, their interests in relation to the development of skills um, and the potential of individuals. And what we've got to make sure is that at all times that is joined up, uh, uh, works effectively and works to the, the satisfaction of individuals who are involved to the best of our ability. OK. I mean, you've both raised a range of issues which I think we want to get into in more detail. I mean, this question of public sector leadership, the question of the film studio we want to get on to. But I just, be, before I move on, I just want to... Um, go back to you, Finn Hesslott, and ask you about this announcement yesterday of the £3 million, £2 million for a tax credit loan fund, uh, and a £1 million for the Screen Industries Skills Fund, which I know was welcomed by the sector. But um, given it was announced yesterday afternoon, um, is it this just a coincidence, or have you just announced this because you were coming here this morning? No, I, th I think it's a coincidence you're having this inquiry at the same time. I, 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 John Swinney and I, myself, had met with the 
um, the film industry represented by the um, IPS back in February and August, and these were the issues that were d discussed with them. Obviously, we're in the process of delivering the 15-16 budget. Um, obviously, the £1 million development fund is from the 15-16 budget. You'll identify on page 108 of the draft budget the financial transactions that, uh, were, that I secured for the culture portfolio. So much as you might want to take credit for this, uh, Mr Fraser, I say these were plans that are in train. And obviously, you know, we, we, it's not uh, in terms of government to dictate the timing of a, an inquiry. I do welcome the inquiry, but actually, in terms of the delivery of the skills investment uh, plan from Creative uh, Scotland and the, the creative industry strategy and, indeed, other areas, there will be significant developments over the next few weeks and months. But a lot of this happened in train. If anything, uh, people's frustrations that they might have liked these announcements sooner rather than later. But uh, I think it's a happy coincidence. All right. Okay. I think if, I, can I, if I can add, just add, Kavina, on the, the particular issue around financial transactions, because this was an issue that emerged out of the discussions that Cabinet Secretary and I had with um, the uh, independent producers where they, they, they put to us a particular problem, which was about um, increasing the scale and the significance of film projects that could be undertaken in Scotland because of the access to external investment finance. And what struck me in the conversation was that the difficulties they were having in accessing that finance from the wider private sector could be resolved by us making available some of the financial transactions that are available to us to deploy. And the Cabinet Secretary made a, a proposition to me during the course of the budget process that um, this was a possibility. Now, as we are finding, and I think as the committee will be aware from the general scrutiny of the budget process, the design of schemes to be compatible with the use of financial transactions is not an easy process. It takes time. And, you know, we would dearly have loved to have cleared this off earlier uh, uh, than we were able to do so. But we have to be satisfied that the basis upon which this finance is being offered can be paid back, because I have an obligation to pay it back to the Treasury as part of the arrangements around financial transactions. So it's not a simple proposition of just distributing grant finance. We have to be satisfied that the propositions coming forward can actually... And it was loan finance was what was, re what was requested of us by the independent producers, and it's loan finance that we have delivered, but it's loan finance we have to be satisfied we are able to pay back to the Treasury in due course. Okay. There was an announcement from yourself, Fiona Hislop, in October 2013 of a £2 million loan fund for studio development. How much of that money has been spent? Well, it requires somebody wanting to have the loan to actually invest in from the private sector. Uh, and you know that what we have done with the Film Studio Delivery Group was to put out um, a call for applications for private sector um, investment uh, in a film studio, which they, if they so choose, they could access that loan facility. That's not been withdrawn drawn down because there isn't a proposal going forward as part of that original uh, private tender process. What I can tell you... Um, um, in terms of where we are currently, is that Scottish Enterprise have a new proposition that's been put forward that would uh, provide the specification that we've been looking for in the process, that we, the development brief that we put forward last year. Now, should that be successful, that would actually provide uh, the highest sound stage of any location in the UK. Now, that would be a, a significant step forward in providing... Uh, a large studio space, particularly for inward investment, but the challenge for film studio is not just about inward investment of large productions, but it's also supporting the indigenous film industry for smaller scale. Now, that's a live and current uh, discussion. I can't give you extensive information, but that's a movable feast. Now, that means you've got to... It's on request, uh, and then you've got to have a proposition that somebody's asking you for that little facility, and that, and that stands, and that's still available. OK, we'll, we'll come on to the film studio in more detail, but I just, I just wanted to, to... The very last question I'm going to ask before I move on, but on this kind of general point, you had an announcement in October 2013 about a £2 million fund of which not a penny has been spent. You know, you're at the committee today, you announced, by coincidence or not, uh, yesterday afternoon, another £3 million. It all looks a bit like a sticking plaster approach, doesn't it, rather than a, a demonstrating leadership and having an overall strategy no, no, to take the film sector forward. No, I, I, I disagree with that. If you look, if you look at the, the funding element, when uh, Scottish Screen was in existence, it invested £3 million in film. Um, the latest figures are from Creative Scotland that are at £8 million. So that's a significant increase. Now, that's also a time that we all know across... I'm sitting next to the 
Finance Secretary, I'm careful of my, my remarks here, but at a time of very difficult budgets across all of government. So if you look at also the investment in the screen, when we came into power, the investment in the screen was £16 million. Um, in 13 14 it was £21 million. The announcement we made yesterday will take that to 24. Now, that is significant. Would we want to see more investment in production in other areas? Yes. So there has been progress and there has been movement, but there are opportunities. And I think the, the issue is how do we, how, how do we realise the scale of ambition and opportunity there is for the film industry. I share that with the film industry, but also the pace and the activity is also dependent a great deal on the private sector, and that's those discussions are not something we can dictate, and I'm sure the committee, uh, in your wider scrutiny of other areas, know the challenges that it's, you, 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 government can't dictate the private sector what it does. We have to work in partnership, and that's what we've been doing. Okay. Um, brief supplementary from Chick Brody. Uh, good, morning. good morning. In the Scottish Government paper that we received, it said Creative Scotland, the Scottish Government is providing funding of around £52 million in 2014-15 to enable Creative Scotland to fulfil their role as a national body. The year before that, they got four point, the screen got £4.2 million, all of which was lottery funding. Who's monitoring the actual spend in relation to the strategy? Well, in terms of the Creative Scotland's own, sp uh, own spending, uh, the, some of their funding comes from the Scottish Government, a significant amount always and has done come from, has come from lottery. Uh, what I have managed to do is to protect uh, Creative Scotland's funding and their cultural funding overall. Um, I've also uh, set out in my last reply the increase that Creative Scotland have had in their spend on film. Uh, it went from uh, you know, around £3 million in 2007 8 It's now about £8 million. And in terms of um, the scrutiny of where they spend their money and, and how, it's quite clear from the legislation, and it's not just in Creative Scotland, it's the same for Historic Environment Scotland, as will be uh, Historic Scotland as it is just now, National Libraries of Scotland. I'm prevented as a minister um, but to direct them in terms of curatorial issues. So the decisions on what they spend and the films they spend at and invest in is a decision for Creative Scotland. It's not my job to say, you know, you'll spend on that film but not on, that, uh, on another film. But if you look at it in terms of uh, attracting inward investment for locations, uh, you've seen uh, World War Z. Uh, if you look at um, Outlander, for example, if you also look at uh, some of the films that they've invested in, very successful films, Creative Scotland have been investing in successful films. But I'll make this very important point. We are dealing with the creative sector and the cultural sector. You have to have, yes, successes commercially, but to develop the conditions for great and creative content to, to come through, there will be films that will not be commercially successful, but it's really important that Creative Scotland still supports that sector because from that you will then eventually get uh, some of the successes that come through. So they've got that balancing act. Um, they have to have that creative leadership. I can't, as Minister, direct them or interfere with the decisions they make on that. But in terms of um, the work, I can uh, make sure that they do support the film industry and, and they're very focused in doing it. And I'm delighted that they've now appointed a director of film appointed in the last uh, few weeks. And obviously, um, I, a few weeks ago, I also announced the new chair of Creative Scotland. And uh, he comes from a, a film and television background as well as uh, having previous experience in theatre. So uh, we under no illusion that I, I scrutinise what they do, but they're also very focused on the film industry. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kavira, and good morning. Um, good morning. Uh, perhaps maybe start with yourself, Cabinet Secretary, uh, uh, Fiona Hislop. Um, one of the main criticisms that's been coming through the evidence, both written and oral, is that there seems to be a lack of leadership um, within the industry, uh, and that leadership is, seems to be sort of confusing and conflating some of the problems. Now, we've heard this morning that you're saying it's very diverse, uh, and obviously there's the creative industries uh, partnership as well. But does it lack leadership, and does it lack? Um, I think you know, Mr. Swinney was also saying there was, you know, the appropriate expertise. So, does it lack the leadership, and does it actually have the expertise to take it forward? Uh, right through the sort of film, television and gaming, because, again, three very diverse groups. OK, two points on that. In, in terms of the responsibilities, Creative Scotland have the leadership in coordinating support for the creative industries, working with all the agencies. 
Um, we set up the Creative Industries Partnership uh, five years ago. They chair that, and that brings to the table Scottish Enterprise, Hands and Islands Enterprise, all the different public agencies, Funded Council, Skills Development Scotland. Um, and so that's part of their responsibility. But as, as uh, John Swinney uh, did point out, the business development contribution comes from Scottish Enterprise. In terms of um, that focus uh, that they have... Uh, it's also important that the industry articulates what their wants and needs are, and I'm sure in all the evidence you've heard, a lot of articulation of the wants and needs, not least of the film and television sector. But one of the things um, I was very encouraged by and supported was the establishment of Independent Producers Scotland, IPS. I met with them when they first established. I encouraged the, that, um, that, that body to develop because it's really important for all public agencies to not just respond and coordinate themselves, but actually to work with industry. Industry has to take a lead on this as well in terms of articulating what that ask is, whether it's skills or production. We've responded um, with the announcement yesterday. There are other, there's other work that's ongoing and will continue. So there needs industry, industry responsibility, but also public sector. And in terms of the public agencies, um, it's quite clear where that uh, leadership should lie. But the key players, and I think that's where you're, you're coming to in a lot of the questions you're asking of me and also of uh, previous witnesses is in relation to uh, how Scottish Enterprise and, and Creative Scotland can bridge what is a, a tension between creative talent and uh, business opportunity. Um, and that will always and has been a, a, an issue uh, and we need to get better at dealing with that and I, I acknowledge that. In terms of ministerial responsibility, um, obviously uh, John Sweeney takes the responsibility for economic development and growth. Uh, each of us as ministers have a key interest in the key sectors. Um, obviously, the health secretary has a key interest in life sciences. The uh, uh, Rich Lockhead has a key interest in food and drink. And in creative industries, I take a, a leader responsibility to have an overview of what government can do in this area. But uh, I, I would point out I have one of the smallest budgets in the area, in, in this sector, but it's important of working with the private sector as well as other agencies to maximise what we can do deliver. And I've said, despite constraints over my budget over a considerable amount of time, we have seen actual increases in, uh, in, in funding and investment in film. I would like it to be more, and we'll work with the sector to, to improve that over the piece. And Creative Scotland um, last week suggested that uh, as part of, you know, they, they are looking at obviously appointing a, a, a new, you know, various directors as well to, to try and obviously um, manage the sort of diversity that we have. But they also said that they could do better, but that probably is dependent on getting more funding. Well, there's a number of areas you've obviously heard directly from them. These questions are probably um, better addressed to themselves. But remember, the Arts Council previously did not have a role or leadership or coordination in creative industries. That was a new responsibility that was established when Creative Scotland was, uh, was set up. And Janet Archer has set out how she's made sure that there's more alignment with industry. Um, and I think that's to be welcomed. And that's why, with Natalie Usher being appointed as the director of film, that was it, the last few weeks. Uh, so the last few months uh, uh, towards the, the tail end of, of last year. Um, so that focus is there and also on creative industries. But there's also synergies across uh, sectors as well, um, whether it's in gaming, digital, uh, film, television. If you look at the kind of that whole media, that it's important not just to look at the you know, silos of those industries themselves, but Channel 4, for example, is a very good example where we've worked with skills and development and funding with them, but also how they have interactive... Um, and also offshoot um, gaming opportunities from some of their television production. So it's important that the sector is seen in the round and not just in isolation of different, mm -hmm. different elements. And again, I think that was very good, the evidence that was provided to you from the computer gaming, how they are also reaching across different sectors, not just entertainment, but health and other areas. So the synergy across digital media is going to be very important going forward as well. Yeah, on the computer and gaming... Um uh, and to be fair to um, uh, them in some respects, uh, they were probably less critical of, of government uh, in many ways and they understood that the industry needs to take that lead. However, they were slightly critical about uh, Scottish Enterprise in terms of the account management, saying that they tend to fall between the stools of uh, Creative Scotland and a, a Scottish Enterprise, and certainly the account management, because see, there is a system there for a one-size-fits-all, and it doesn't really fit what they require. Uh, perhaps, um, Mr Swinney, it, probably maybe for yourself to answer, mm -hmm. that. Is there any flexibility within the role of um, Scottish Enterprise and the account management to assist uh, the computer and gaming's industry? 
Well, there'll, there'll be a range of there are a range of computer gaming companies that are account managed by Scottish Enterprise, and um, I have uh, you know, read the the evidence that's come forward on this, and and you know I'll you know I'll obviously listen very carefully to what the the committee concludes on these questions, and um, whatever the committee concludes, um, I will um, consider and pursue with Scottish Enterprise because the account management system has got to address the needs of business within Scotland. And um, whatever that business is, um, now, the mandate that we've given to Scottish Enterprise is that the account management system should um, focus on companies with growth potential. Now, that often gets confused, and I hear this shorthand frequently, that that's, um, that's support for big companies that small companies don't get that. Well, you know, I've visited two-person companies who are account managed by Scottish Enterprise, and they are account managed because they have got growth potential. Now, so I, I think there, there, well, to answer Mr Robertson's question directly, there must be flexibility in the system to make sure that the needs of different and distinctive sectors are recognised and addressed by Scottish Enterprise in the selection of companies that are account managed. So a key proposition is that they must be able to demonstrate growth potential. Um, but growth potential in one sector will look different to growth potential in another sector. So, of course, there must be flexibility in that respect. But I certainly want to assure the committee that um, for business development purposes, um, companies in the creative industry sector uh, should have just as much right to attract account managed account management support from Scottish Enterprise, just as they are able to access all different ranges of business development support packages that we have available, whether it's through um, Scottish Enterprise or through ventures such as the EDGE Fund, which are designed to support new start companies, um, that in whatever sector they're operating, they have access to that type of support. But uh, obviously, I, I, you know, I will look very carefully at the evidence that's been marshalled um, in this inquiry and whatever conclusions the committee arrives at. One of those aspects um, would be to try and obviously convey that information to the industry itself, because they, they, they seem to suggest anyway that they, they, they don't have the, the information available to them uh, in some respects. The communication, there, there's a sort of breakdown in communication to the industry itself. Um, and, and this is why they're, they're sort of probably calling for sort of more clarity. Um, we, if, well, if I had, we, we have um, Scottish Enterprise operate just now around about um, I think about eighteen to twenty industry leadership groups that draw together um, various players in different industries to make sure that Scottish Enterprise, in formulating its interventions in uh, in the economy, is informed by the needs and the aspirations of business, and increasingly. Um, we've been encouraging that discussion to spread across the whole range of different areas where industrial sectors and commercial sectors within the economy will have needs for public sector support. So, for example, on skills, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned the skills investment plan around the creative sector. That's a product of the dialogue with industry to make sure that our colleges and universities and our wider education system are actually putting in place the provision that will meet the needs of individual sectors. So the, 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 there should be um, a very open dialogue about what are the needs of different sectors within the economy and they should be addressed by the, uh, the conclusions uh, that we arrive at from the, the interaction with public agencies and particularly with Scottish Enterprise. Yeah, thank you. I wonder, if, um, come back to yourself, Cabinet Secretary, um, in respect of going back to this leadership and expertise, um, it was suggested that it, does the, the public sector have a role in encouraging mentoring as well? Uh, well, well, clearly in terms of business development, um, the, the support that we provided from Scottish Enterprise, but the best people to mentor uh, specialists whether it's gaming or other, is the industry itself. 
helping support um, the kind of network that can provide that is something that the public sector uh, can do. The Scottish Games Network has been established. Again, there's mentoring there. It's about kind of supporting the kind of sector itself, especially new entrants. And um, the digital, John, we talked about the different leadership groups. There's a digital media uh, leadership group, and that's one of kind of areas, if that's a request from them, that they want that kind of mentoring supported. But it's also about the industry itself supporting itself. Um, but if there's a kind of, in terms of the specials and the mentoring must come from the industry to itself, but there's different aspects of that. And one of the areas, particularly in relation to um, growing new businesses in the creative sector, a very good project is um, a programme is Starter for Six, which is run from the Cultural Enterprise Office within Creative Scotland. And it provides, um, yes, uh, funding and support, but also a kind of um, mentoring support for new businesses in the creative sector. And having spoken to a number of the companies that have come through that, what they've said is actually the networking and the business mentoring, and that's about the business development side, has probably been as valuable valuable to them as the actual investment itself. They, they might not realise at the beginning, but that's also an example why mentoring, particularly in the creative uh, industry sector, is, is really important. I'm sure it's important in a lot of different sectors, but that's the feedback we get as well. So it's more about coordination yeah. and support for that. Yeah. Yeah, it is coordination and support, and I think the industry acknowledged that they should take the lead in terms of mentoring. I don't think they're suggesting that the, the public sector should do that, but I think there's hoping that the, the leadership um, would come from the public sector in, in terms of that coordination and trying to bridge the gap, because obviously they themselves within the private sector, you know, would find it very difficult um, to to, uh, to I suppose hold a directory of who re who requires that mentoring. One point I'd say here is that I, I think there has to be I think from Mr. Robson's questions an acceptance that um, industry needs to articulate its needs and its requirements and that's very welcome from the perspective of government because the more we can encourage industry to be very clear about what public sector intervention will be of assistance in ensuring industry fulfills its potential that that could not be a more welcome approach from government so to, to ensure that we can refine exactly what we can do to try to support the development of particular sectors of the economy so the more there is um, clarity of industry aspiration, the more we can focus public sector support to deliver on the aspirations of those sectors. Yeah, thank you. And finally, convener, um, one of the main criticisms, uh, Cabinet Secretary, was the number of meetings that were taking place um, with Creative Scotland uh, and the industry. Uh, and I think we had uh, a number of 26. Uh, and last week we were well, probably assured that perhaps the next meeting would be the meeting that will actually resolve this, uh, the, the, the problems and take things forward. Could you respond to that? Uh, well, I, I don't have the detail of what meetings were had when, but I did hear the comments. Um, I, I would say, actually, I've come to, to this committee before. I would have the opportunity to next meet with IPS to go through the announcements we've just uh, just made this week, which was again came as a direct response to one of the two meetings that John and I had with IPS. I think those comments were made before the announcements and also the progress. So uh, I think it's fair for people to, to, to identify if they've not seen progress from those meetings to, to be critical. I hope that they've now realised that there is a Progress. And indeed, I think the witness that made those comments um, is quoted in the paper to say, saying that this is a, a, a start in terms of that uh, dialogue and, and is uh, encouraged by it. But she also indicated that there's more to do. I recognise yeah. that. And I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure you welcome that progress, and it's, as does the industry. Yeah. But you would also acknowledge that it, it does seem, you know, a bit, um, uh, a bit, the, 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 the number of meetings that have taken place without progress was, was quite concerning. But I don't. I, I don't know the detail of them. I mean, on one hand, public agencies and government gets acu get accused of not having enough meet meetings yeah. with the industry, and then you get criticised for having too much. I'm sure there's a, a happy medium uh, in there <laughs> yeah. somewhere, but I think that the most important thing is to make sure you've got good relationships, that the industry can articulate what their needs are. It can be varied uh, from different types of industries, and also even within one area, you can have uh, different demands and interests, and that's what the Balancing Act has to be. How can you provide support, whether it's on the three elements in film in industry, for example, on development, on production, and on infrastructure that meets the needs of, of most of the industry. You're not always going to meet everybody's needs at the right time. But uh, I think uh, engagement is a good thing um, if you get results, and I think that's what uh, that's what we're in the, in the process of doing. And results is what we're looking for. Yeah, exactly.
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Lewis MacDonald. Yeah, I'd like to follow that up because I think Dennis Robertson mentions the 26 meetings that were highlighted by, by witnesses, and, and, and I think the critical thing here is not the number of meetings, but the conclusion that in spite of all the meetings, nothing had changed. And, and that, was, that, I think, was what caused concern. Yeah, to and I, th of the I think, as, as, as John Swinney identified, one of the um, discussions we had was about this loan financing using financial transaction tax, and it's not a, 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 it wasn't a, an easy process. You have to there's a lot of kind of considerations and accountability that government has, and also to identify how that package could usefully be used. It's been used for other mechanisms. It's not been used um, in this area before. This is a pilot. We want to see how successful it is. I think that's important to, to note. But that will take working. That's not just meetings for meetings' sake. That's actually working out what that looks like. But Precisely and. You know, I, 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 I don't. I'm not privy to the the list of 26 meetings that have allegedly taken place. But you know, I think Parliament would be a bit surprised if there weren't the necessity to have a number of meetings to make sure that um, loan funding that we are making available, for which I am accountable to Parliament, is not being put out there with a proper understanding of how that finance will be handled because of the necessity for it to be repaid. This is public money we're talking about. So Lewis MacDonald, I would have thought, would have been at the front of the queue to accuse me of not scrutinising matters enough to get points to a conclusion. And there's a huge amount of detail has to be undertaken about some of these questions. So I, I, you know, I, I think the, um, the, there's extensive engagement here. We could go to other sectors of the economy and we could have other sectors of the economy could probably tell us about you know a vast number of meetings that had taken place as well, because there are you know there's loads of meetings take place all over the shop. We're all involved in meetings all the time, uh, but it's about trying to ensure that we're progressing on an agenda in which we take everybody with us in getting to the right destination. And on this question, I don't know how many of the of the, of the 26 yeah, meetings yeah. I'm guilty of requiring because I wanted proper financial scrutiny about the financial transactions. I don't know how many of them I've insisted upon. But I think Parliament would be a bit surprised if I wasn't making sure there was due process in place for the handling of public money. Well, what John Archer told us was that uh, one of the meetings they had uh, with yourself uh, last March was one in which you undertook to get Scottish Enterprise to sort its approach to the film industry. And the evidence he gave us a fortnight ago was that that hadn't happened. So, 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 so the bigger issue here, we've, we've heard a lot of evidence in this committee. We haven't heard a lot of witnesses saying what we really need is a £2 million loan fund, although I'm sure that will be welcome. Well, I, heard John but, Archer, but, I heard John Archer on the radio this morning saying it was a welcome absolutely. response what? from the government and also saying it was something that I had suggested as a response to what the industry was demanding. Absolutely, but what we heard from a, much, a, a, a very wide range of witnesses was their call for some clarity, some focus, some leadership from government. And, and, and I think that's the bigger, the bigger picture, the bigger yeah, issue. Okay. And, and, and I think it's what we really well, need to, to get I, to I, th I, th I, think, I think the position has been set out by the Cabinet Secretary, and it's absolutely crystal clear. Leadership on this question of the development of the creative industries rests within government, with Creative Scotland and with the Cabinet Secretary for Culture. Um, and... So that's where leadership rests for development of the creative industries. But Creative Scotland and the Cabinet Secretary have a call on other players in the public sector to support the strategic efforts that are taken forward by Creative Scotland and by the Cabinet Secretary. And I would want to give the committee the assurance, the very clear assurance, that um, any support that can be given to that process by other government agencies, whether responsible to me in my portfolio responsibility as the Finance Secretary, with responsibility for Scottish Enterprise and Hans Hans Enterprise, will be made available to the Culture Secretary and Creative Scotland. And in terms of my wider responsibilities as the Deputy First Minister, if um, there is any involvement or participation required of other public bodies, I would make it my business to make sure the Cabinet Secretary was supported in securing that. That's clearly what that's clearly appropriate. It's clearly appropriate that public bodies should work together. I think the, the critical thing is whether the direction and leadership being provided is effective. And and I was very interested to hear John Swinney say that they would welcome hearing more of what the industry wants and the loan fund he cited as an example. But th there have been other things that they've put 
here, which I suspect they've put to you directly. They would like, for instance, to have a task force led by a key film person uh, in the industry to try and sort out the issues around uh, remits and, and, and leadership and direction. And, and I guess they would like to have a sense that the government takes seriously the position that, that the sector finds itself in. Uh, Alan Clements told us two weeks ago that eight years ago Scotland was number two centre of production for television programming in, in, in the UK, and we're now down to fourth or fifth, and, and, and he described that as a, 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 an indictment of public policy. That, that suggests to me that while you may be clear technically as to where leadership lies, is the leadership coming, and, 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 and if, if, if not, what can be done to address that? I think I'll address that point because I, I saw that in evidence. Clearly, there's been decisions uh, taken, particularly around the BBC, to develop Salford, and that's, quite a, kind of, that's a deliberate move from them. They've also uh, looked to commission more widely. Uh, we had called for, again, with cross-party support from this parliament for greater production from the BBC, so that has increased substantially from where it was. But also, in terms of where we were eight years ago, at that time, STV was producing long-term drama like Taggart and uh, you know, broadcasters themselves are not without their own responsibilities when it comes to sustainability in the film and screen sector. One of the first things I did when I took on the role of um, cultural responsibility was to bring together the independent producers together with the broadcasters because at that point the relationship was not maybe, maybe as happy as it might have been but also to, to air the concerns about the, the growth of the sector very much relies also on the commissioning that comes from broadcasting. So STV, for example, um, you know, in the past had produced some very you know, strong dramas. Um, I'm not going to you know, talk about the merits of the content, but what I can say is, is long-term sustainable drama is what helps the industry develop, not just in terms of, obviously, the most obvious, you know, the acting, but also you know, technicians, um, all the different, uh, you know, the, the, the different in disciplines that are used, and actually part of the progress of where I want to go next in terms of working with the area is actually to work with the BBC and also STV to encourage more sustainability. And they can't just take the best of the cream of the crop of of, of the talent that's out there uh, for their own purposes. They have to invest back in. Now, my discussions, my first discussion with Tony Hall, for example, uh, that's one of the areas that we've had a, a good dialogue on about how they can help in skills and training and apprenticeships and um, I gave you the example of Channel 4 working with Creative Skillset again it's, it's, you know funding from public sector to help in, in, in their area but I think that same ask can be made of both BBC and STV so do I want to see expansion do I think there's an opportunity yes I think one of the key roles though is commissioning because some of the kind of the decisions around commissioning, a lot of programmes have been transferred in, in terms of production to Scotland. But do, do they reflect Sc the Scottish character or Scottish? You know, what is, is it? You know, are they just films that could be made anywhere? Now, any business is welcome, but a lot of the content of that is something that's shown UK wide. It could be made particularly anywhere. Uh, but we do want to make sure that the commissioning decision making is absolutely critical. And I don't think, in terms of where we are with either the BBC or STV, we've got to a maximum. Position. So yes, I do think that um, the investment and the areas that we have responsibility, of, um, we can do more in that area. I'm, I'm absolutely clear. I think the potential for film in Scotland is extensive. But don't underestimate where we are. We've just gone through a year where we've had the highest level of investment um, in terms of inward investment for film. Um, the Outlander production, for example, uh, £40 million in one year is the highest level. The year before that was £33 million. That's the highest level of inward investment and share we've had for some time. Now, the scope for more, absolutely, and we can build on the success of that. But I think the responsibility is not just for, for government, it's also for the industry. And I would play that back also to STV and BBC in particular. I, I hear that point, but you well, do... That's you, that's you, you, yeah, indeed, indeed. You, you, you do accept, nonetheless that as government and as the responsible minister as we've heard this morning, you have a role in engaging with these commissioners yeah, and securing I, that I kind do, of and focus. I, I meet regularly with BBC and STV on these issues. OK, we'll need, we'll need to move on because I'm conscious of the time, and, and, and I think we want to get on to the issue of the film studio, and I'll bring in Joan McAlpin. Thank you very much, um, Yes, in terms of the film studio, I mean, I personally am aware that this is a long-running saga. Um, I used to edit the culture section of the Sunday Times Scotland in the 1990s and film journalists would regularly approach with stories about a new film studio which then never materialised and 
uh, over the years you began to realise it probably wasn't going to be one. But one of our witnesses uh, even said that it was discussed back in the 1940s. So clearly it's been it's something that goes back a long way. And you have set up a, a delivery group. Do you think you will be the government who finally delivers on this long, long running yes. issue? Yes. Yes. I'm determined that we will. Right. In terms of the group itself, the delivery group itself, um, when we spoke to Scottish Enterprise and Creative Scotland last week, they said it was a civil, a group of civil servants. The industry is asking for an industry input to drive that. Do you think that would be possible? Uh, I think it's important that we respond to the needs of industry, but um, in particularly in relation to the process to date, um, obviously we had uh, the most comprehensive assessment of what was available, what we could do in terms of film that was published in March 2014. We then had the tender process. Now, it's kind of difficult to um, engage with uh, particularly individuals who are involved in the tender process, who are then also in, in, in directly involved in shaping government um, viewer civil servants view on something that they themselves are tendering for. I think that's kind of fairly straightforward. Um, those, that tender process is now closed. Um, there is now um, a new proposal that has been received by Scottish Enterprise. It does exceed the development brief that was initially set out last year. Um, they're in active dis discussions, and I, as I, I set out, in terms of we think that will provide good value to the public purse. It will reflect the um, industry needs. They've been quite clear that they want, uh, you know, in terms of location or in terms of particularly height and indeed um, the facilities that would be available, what industry requires, that has been articulated. The actual delivery in terms of the content and production of that, I think, would be best informed by industry itself as well. But that's the whole point. It's got to be front-facing. Uh, but also we've got to respect that we are dealing with the private sector here and you know we can't dictate to private sector proposals what they, uh, what they will or will not provide. We can set out the development brief and the development brief was absolutely informed directly by industry requests. I think um, uh, particularly that was uh, set out uh, in the report that was produced in March 2014. That was informed by probably um, some of the numerous meetings that have been referred to earlier. That's exactly what that is. So, um, you know, I'm happy to come back to the committee or, or write to the committee when we've got progress on that. But a lot of that is in the hands of the private sector as well. We have to be as responsive as we can when we get a proposal that is suitable. Do you have any idea of the timescale? Um, it's, it's the new proposal that I've just talked about is in uh, Scottish Enterprises currently in discussions with that uh, proposition. I can't, I, I'm not going to give you a, a time. Scale. I know it's frustrating. Um, I told you I'm determined to, to, to deliver, but government can't deliver something that is reliant on private sector. Why do I say that? And I think it's an important point. Is the uh, European Commission are quite clear that a public sector investment uh, would breach state aid rules? So I can't say to you that I, you know, if I I could just go and build a public sector government studio, that would not that would breach state aid rules in relation to the European um, Commission. And indeed, uh, just in July last year, they were quite clear in terms of. Um, issuing regulations of what could be done. So it's been done in partnership with the sector, um, but I, I, I'm happy to write to the committee and make sure that you're informed as when progress is being made. On the state aid rules, we've been given a very useful briefing on that um, by SPICE, which shows just how complex the whole issue is. Um, can I ask if, if you have obtained detailed, adv detailed advice on how a studio for film in Scotland could be delivered within the constraints of state aid rules? Well, I, th I think uh, the introduction of the new general block exemption regulation effective from the 1st of July 2014 uh, particularly informs the uh, uh, position Article 53, Aid for Cultural and Heritage Conservation. Under this article, eligible costs, including construction costs, can be supported if at least 80% of uh, the time or space is for cultural purposes. And that's not commercial. That's for Indigenous cultural uh, uh, provision and the uh, view, not uh, not uh, formal view, but informal view, is that uh, it's not intended uh, purpose of this article um, for construction you know, for construction. So the issue of state aid is particularly around construction, and uh, Article 54 aid uh, schemes for audiovisual works under this article. I quote: "Aim for film studio infrastructures shall not be eligible." And then obviously the case, the market economy investor principle. In July 2014, there was a case that was taken on the. Valencia studio uh, were quite clearly 100% uh, uh, publicly funded and it was quite clear under the ruling from the Commission in July 14 that again um, they breached state aid so it's quite, you know, it's, it's really clear where we are. That's not been in position in the past and the big difference with 
I think people say, well, what about Wales and what about um, Northern Ireland? Is they had state assets that could be converted, and as part of the assessment, the comprehensive assessment informed by industry's needs. Um, that took place and the report was published March 2014. As you know, We were constantly looking for different um, uh, facilities, but there aren't any state aid assets that could be converted. Uh, primarily there's a height issue, there's pillars, all the rest of it. That wasn't the case in Wales or indeed in Northern Ireland. Right. One of the things that struck me reading the Spice paper is that you, you talked about it has to have a, a cultural dimension, but that would be judged in the terms of, of British culture. Um, I know that the studio in Valencia uh, failed because it was believed that um, there was enough provision already in Spain. Would we um, would we suffer because there was quite a lot of film production space elsewhere in the United Kingdom, for example? Um, or could we argue, you know, our specific case as you know a, a nation within the United Kingdom? Or would it, the European Union not look at it in that context? It's something that um, I'm, I'm happy if I, I, I don't really this correctly to, 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 to correct this. My understanding is that market, if market failure was demonstrated in Scotland, there would be a provision that we could provide public sector funding. Now, you will all be aware that we have studio facilities either in existence or being proposed. Um, and if there are other opportunities for private sector inv investment, then you would be breaching um, stated rules in relation to... The, 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 you can evidence market failure because quite clearly there is a market there. Right. OK, just one more question. Yes, um, so it's actually on a, a, another thing that the producers were very strong. They were very strong on, obviously, the, the, the studio, but also on a dedicated screen agency. Now, I know it was the previous uh, Labour administration that took the original decision to uh, form Creative Scotland and get rid of Scottish Screen ultimately. Um, but certainly the strong, uh, the strong message from the industry is that they would like their own dedicated screen agency. And I wondered how you would look at that. Would you look at that sympathetically? Well, quite clearly, um, in the establishment of Creative Scotland, they brought in creative industries that hadn't been there previously. It was a merger with uh, Scottish Screen. Um, I've already relayed that the, the spend on film by Creative Scotland is now almost, or will be actually after yesterday's announcement, three times more than it was under Scottish Screen. However, I think the point is a point of focus and also being able to uh, complete... Uh, and I, I would one thing I would say is don't I, I don't want a committee to be under uh, any view that somehow um, there isn't good service being provided to the film industry from the dedicated people within Creative Scotland. I think you've also had evidence um, that actually has articulated the appreciation by the film industry of the work that is taking taking place within that. Um, Janet Archer herself um, has talked about how she's reorganised within Creative Scotland to put more focus on the three elements of whether it's culture or creative industries or film and I think that will be helpful and as I said there's an appointment of a director of film um, at the end of uh, uh, last year as well. Uh, so I, I think that we work with where we, what we have just now. Um, I think that in terms of what that student agency can do, if they've got more resources um, to, to invest, then that will be helpful. So going from eight million to, to you know, if you add on the, the three, you know, 11 million, that's a, that's a significant increase for them. The element that we need to really work on is on production, but that will not only involve the screen agency. We would always, whether we had a separate screen agency or whether it's within Scottish um, uh, Creative Scotland, would still involve work with other agencies like um, Scottish Enterprise. Uh, but I, I do think that um, that you know, we're, we have attracted good f um, film um, opportunities in terms of people using Scotland as a location. I want us to do more. And as I said, we've got, you know, in terms of £40 million of inward investment for Outlander, that's a very strong proposition. The problem, I think, is that everybody has seen Game of Thrones, but uh, Outlander has not been filmed in Scotland yet. I think people might have more of an appreciation of the scale and impact of that once that's actually seen on, on our screens. But I, I'm not of the view that we need a, a separate agency. But I do think that we need to give every support to the film sector um, that staff that are operating within uh, Creative Scotland. And I actually think that shining a spotlight on, on this issue will help that position as well. So I, you know, I know it might be some of the questioning might be critical and some of the evidence might be, but actually I think it's important that Scotland knows from its parliament how important this sector is and the important role that those film professionals within the Creative Scotland are providing. Thanks very much. Okay, I've got two members who want to come in also in the film studio. First of all, um, John Lamont and then Patrick Harvey. John. Thanks very much and I appreciate the fact that the two cabinet secretaries are here because I think 
one of the main messages that came out in our evidence is that this is both about creativity, but it's not just about that, it's actually about how it matters to the economy. It's an industry, and people can be creative, but they still require business support. I don't... I, it, I, I referred before to the artists in the Garrett, Good Society support that. These are critical, I think, in terms of the economy. So I think um, we also have to recognise that people are saying, you know, you and I will be happy to go to 26 meetings. That's what we do for a living, we go to meetings. But people who are trying to run a business want these meetings to be as few as possible and as productive as possible. So, And we've had some evidence that people have regarded it as not worth the effort to get engaged with public um, agencies because of the amount of non-productive time that is used. So I suppose, in, for me, the film studio is almost both practical but also a symbol of a broader feeling. I mean, I can't overstate the, the, the frustration of evidence. We said the industry is in crisis. They regard the industry as being in crisis and that while on the creative side you support this initiative about business and losing out to other parts of the United Kingdom, and the film studio is a symbol of our, un, our being unable to engage in that, with that very increased competition, which is highly commercial. So I suppose um, I would want to ask um, the, the Deputy First Minister, I'm advised that producers have received no development funding in the last five years. So the business development side of these industries, which are so important, are not being supported. Is that why we're therefore losing out in competition with other parts of the United Kingdom? Well, yeah, as I explained in my other answer, the um, companies will, um, Scottish Enterprise will make uh, decisions about the degree of support that they give to companies through the account management process, and that is essentially uh, that determines exactly how um, the, uh, the the support is available to assist companies to develop and to enhance their their, their propositions. Now. A, there are a range of companies that will be um, account managed and uh, within the the whole creative industry sector um, and they will receive particular support dependent on their circumstances and their and, and, and their and, and, and their aspirations um, and that will be you know that's the normal course of judgments that will be made by Scottish enterprise in this process the reflection of the quality of the companies that no company no producer has received development funding in the last five years, despite the fact that you said there is flexibility and you recognise that commercially we're losing out. This is not about how good the ideas are. We're commercially losing out to other parts of the United Kingdom, where presumably people are getting more support than they're getting in Scotland. Well, the, the, the judgments arrived at by um, Scottish Enterprise about the companies they're able to support and the business propositions that they're able to support. And what we've tried to do in the response to the particular requests of the producers is to put forward a, a mechanism which would enable those producers to gain access to the type of loan financing which was announced yesterday, which has been the subject of discussion for some time, uh, to give those producers the opportunity to access resources that enable them to grow and to strengthen the business propositions that they're involved in. So um, that resource is available for companies to be able to take forward. I mean, I think everybody has said it's welcome. It does not reflect, I don't think, the evidence and demands of people looking for direct support for what is a critical industry and we're losing out commercially. So I think there is a, there's a problem. I, think, I can I, ask I think, you about something, something else, but I, I don't get a sense. And I actually don't think this is um, an issue which politicians are going to fight with each other um, in terms of the party position at all. I think this is a challenge for government to get different bits to come together to an industry that doesn't really fit. And, and so, you know, I understand the challenge. One of the things that was um, explained, was highlighted to us, is that the remits of Creative Scotland in terms, in terms of being able to give support and the remit of Scottish Enterprise are in contradiction to each other. So are you aware of that challenge? And would you be at least willing to go and look, see if that can be sorted? Because it, it, the sense in which not only are they not complementing each other, but they're contradictory to each other, are, are inhibiting people. What respect? Well, I think it was explained to me that you have to have a certain level of um, turnover in order to access Scottish Enterprise support. There has been no Scottish Enterprise support, so that would suggest that's maybe the case. But the level of funding you can access from Creative Scotland, I think one figure was quoted to me was ten thousand pounds well, for supporting the development of the work. I, 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 well, 
Let me say, I'm certainly very happy to uh, to look at um, any areas where there may be um, a difficulty of the alignment of remits of organisations, because there shouldn't be. And uh, if there was, I would address that, and the, and the Cabinet Secretary for, uh, for, for Culture and I would address that immediately. That's I mean, quite, I, yeah, now, now, to, now, to, I think that's very honest, useful because I do well, think well, well, that the well, heart well, of this well, is, me, is me, creative if, and yeah, industry. Yeah, but maybe, maybe if I could give question. an answer, um, it would be quite nice. helpful. Um, the, you know, the Culture Secretary and I have met with independent producers um, on a number of occasions and I, I, I've I've not heard this argument about there being some problem with the remit. Now, if there is, then I'll happily look at that and try to address that. Um, I've certainly heard the issue about alignment, and Jan Lamont for herself has said that it is a challenge to get organisations in alignment working in a cohesive fashion. That is what we have been working to do, but on the basis of the model that the that Creative Scotland is in the lead on creative um and the creative sector, and they have a call on other organisations to support and reinforce their activities. And, you know, I'm not aware of any contradictions in remit, but if there are, we will certainly address those. Well, I recommend that you um, have a look at the evidence, but it's very explicit in the evidence that's given to us. And also, I go back to this issue that while Creative Scotland is about the cultural heart of Scotland and all the rest of it. We have to have a fundamental business model that allows us to compete in the commercial world against other parts of the United Kingdom where we're losing out. And I think that um, is the challenge in, in that regard. Can I just, finally, on the question of film studio, um, I have no um, doubt that, that Fiona Hislop is entirely sincere in her determination to make this happen. But could you give us at least an indication will it happen before 2016? Can I just say, it will happen when that agreement is, is made with a... I cannot speak on behalf of a private sector company. No, but you have, you're, you're a critical player in encouraging the private sector. This is not something separate from you. This is something that the industry wants in order that economically Scotland benefits. Yeah. So can we say it would be reasonable to suggest that by the time this parliament um, rises in May 2016, there will at least be a clear plan and a timescale... I, I think that's a perfect. I think that's a perfectly reasonable request to make. Um, I, that's that's my response to to, to, to your second point. Y your first point about the the industry. I think one of the things that you've had evidence of that we are very conscious of is the need for film to scale up very quickly. And I think it's the issue of scale and the speed by which projects come to fruition, uh, both for gaming but also. Um, on film, and you, and you referred to amounts that were, were invested. Creative Scotland have recently increased their availability of production funding for any one film from 300,000 to 500,000. Now, people might say, is that an offer? Should we be able to have a greater call? If it's obviously a big blockbuster investment, that would then look at um, wider, you know, wider agency support. But within Creative Scotland, half a million pounds for one project and one film is what they have available. And some of the films have funded with that 500,000 pounds for any one project have been significant previously they would have been on the £300,000 threshold so just to correct the point about £10,000 for development in terms of uh, production funding that's the scale of what Creative Scotland can provide anything larger than that would obviously need to require a different type of funding but by that time you're almost looking at a scale of a big major inward investment proposition which puts it probably in a similar territory as you might get for whether it's on life sciences or, or other areas but in terms of the ambition for yes I think you appreciate my uh, my sincerity and my determination for a film studio, but not all the cards are in my hand. I will, I, I, and I'm absolutely clear that you know, in terms of what is reasonable, in terms of people's expectations, what you have set out is perfectly reasonable. Okay. Um, I'm going to bring in Patrick Harvey on film studios. Before I do that, I just want to comment. We are more than two-thirds of the way through our time and quite a number of members still to come in and issues to pursue, so we can tighten up a little bit on questions and answers. That would be helpful. Well, just very briefly, convener on, on this question, and it, it leads off, it was going to be in, in the area of Jan Lamont's final question there. Uh, we appreciate not all of the cards are in your hands, uh, Cabinet Secretary, but in, in answering Joan McAlpine's question, will this government be the government that delivers on that long-standing ambition? You gave a very unequivocal yes. How can you give that unequivocal yes, and then two minutes later say you can't put a time scale on it, and then ten minutes later say that that within the term of this government is a reasonable thing to ask for. 
Well, in terms of army, what did that government... unequivocal yes mean? Yeah, well, the... and where did it go? <laughs> It went, are we the government that would deliver on this? I think the answer is yes, we will. In terms of uh, John, uh, Joanne Lamott's comments about the kind of what is a reasonable plan, can we have a plan in place in order to deliver? In, in, uh, they're, mutually, they're not mutually exclusive questions. It, you, you'll appreciate the, the, the difficulty of giving an unequivocal answer yes. Uh, you know, I know ministers sometimes think that their government will last forever, but none of them do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I can't. A lot of what um, I, you know, I've, I've related to today is, is commercial and confidential, so I'm not going to be able. To, I don't want to relate, and I can't be in the position that I can uh, announce to you or indeed uh, go further than I can in relation to that discussion. So I have got confidence, right? But it's not been realised as yet. Uh, but I, I, I am hopeful it can be done, and I'm, I'm fairly confident in my response to, to Joan that it will be. But I can't give you the information in terms of timescales of exactly what will be delivered and when it will be delivered. Okay, so it's an optimistic yes. Yes. <laughs> Another yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Um, briefly, Chick brody has got something. To Just following on, <coughs> Cabinet Secretary, um, Skip was established in 2009. We're now six years down the road, and to talk about the dilemma of who owns what, I asked a question last week, where does the buck stop? And eventually, after some confusion, we were told it stops with uh, Creative Scotland. But Creative Scotland just produced their own marketing strategy. Scottish Enterprise are producing a strategy on the sector as one of the three emerging sectors. Uh, and then Creative Industries uh, are producing an overall strategy within SCIP uh, for in, in hopefully this month. There is a dilemma. Who do we look to to say, right, the buck stops with you? Creative Scotland believes it's them, but we also have a commercial uh, uh, component that has to be addressed as well. I come back to the question I, I asked earlier. It's fine having progress on the, on the cultural side, but who's driving the commercial side? I think, we'll go, I think what this question takes us back into is the some of the debates that we had in Parliament about whether or not Creative Scotland should have a business development remit. That is what this issue is about, and yeah. let, me, let me address it. Because Parliament determined on this when it legislated for Creative Scotland, and it legislated that the business development remit should sit as it does in every other sector with Scottish Enterprise. And the, the, the view that the government took at the time in, the, in legislating for Creative Scotland was it was appropriate, for the sake of the clarity that Mr Brodie seeks, that it was crystal clear for development of the creative sector, leadership and responsibility rested with Creative Scotland. But they had the ability, as, for example, Visit Scotland, which is the undeniably leading lead player for the development of tourism in the Scottish economy, they have a call on Scottish Enterprise for business development support. Visit Scotland does not carry a business development role for the tourism sector within Scotland. It has leadership of the development of our interests on tourism. Now that was the that that is the that's the policy judgment the government made. And what then follows from that is the requirement which I've talked about in response to questions, that Creative Scotland must feel it is part of a partnership with other public bodies who work together and collaboratively and in a cohesive way to deliver for that in the, uh, business sector of the economy. Um, so that's the, that's the thinking behind it. So to go back to some of the answers that I've already given, it's crystal clear that Creative Scotland is in the lead, but they are entitled to have the business development support of Scottish Enterprise. I accept that, Cabinet Secretary, very briefly. That may be clear to us, and, and certainly you've, you've clarified it, and you know, that was certainly my understanding of, of the role of Scottish Enterprise. I have to say, in the last two witness sessions, that perhaps is not clear to Creative Scotland. I mean, ultimately, they accepted their responsibility. So it may well be that that needs to be clarified in terms of exactly what well, outcomes we expect from Creative Scotland. Well, let's, let, let's, you know, let, let's, um, you know, we, we'll, we'll look at what the committee says in its, in its inquiry and its conclusion, but um, I don't think there could be any dubiety or any uncertainty on anybody's part within Creative Scotland or Scottish Enterprise about where respective responsibilities lie. Because it's been spelt out very clearly by ministers, but if it needs to be spelt out very clearly again, it'll be spelt out very clearly again. Thank you. Okay, 
Um, moving on, um, Gordon MacDonald. Yeah, uh, good morning. And um, a question to Culture Secretary. You quite clearly outlined this morning the opportunities and difficulties facing the independent television production sector in Scotland. And given that the BBC is reviewing its lift and shift policy, and Channel 4 have announced new targets for increasing production uh, from the nations. And, you know, Mr Swinney, you've just said that it's crystal clear um, that Creative Scotland is in the lead in this matter. The difficulty facing the independent production sector is from the evidence we heard last week that Creative Scotland have stated that virtually all of their focus is on film and not the independent production sector television sector. So how, what support is available to independent television producers in order to access this um, increased commission that's going to be coming to Scotland? Uh, the, 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 the different um, areas of this, uh, not least, as, and I go back to my point about the broadcasters themselves as commissioners um, and the increasingly commissioning from independence and that has to be a, a positive relationship. My concern, particularly with the BBC, is their budget's likely to, to reduce substantially um, to 2017. I think it will likely to go down to about 86 million from um, a figure that was way over 100. Now that obviously limits the pool and we have concerns and I know not this committee but uh, your colleagues on the Education and Culture Committee have spoken to the BBC frequently about yeah. that. Um, Channel 4's uh, uh, commitment is welcomed. Um, STV already, as I said, they, they used to have more substantial long-term running dramas that could help the industry. Um, there's an ask on them. Uh, again, uh, there has been, uh, and I, I, I could, we could, the committee, I'm sure, if they ask Creative Scotland, can provide um, the information about Creative Scotland's work with STV in particular in different filming. Um, if you take um, MG Alba, for example, um, support for Bannon, the new um, Gaelic drama, again, you talk about studio space, it is being filmed, as I said, um, in Stornoway, but also, I think, using the Salma Rostick studio there, so the small-scale um, studios, but again, the idea of trying to get sustainability for content writers, hugely important to the success of productions. Um, in relation to... Uh, uh, the issue, uh, this has been a tension, as I said, one of the first things I did was to bring together the broadcasters and the independents um, themselves. The independents benefit from investments from the broadcasters as long as the commissioning of that allows the independents to, 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 to compete. I think one of the continuing criticisms, uh, particularly of, SD, uh, of BBC, is that the idea that you know people may come and do productions shift and lift, but it's not necessarily the, the Scottish talent that is being used whether it's technical or indeed um, professional um, acting, etc., um, and that is a real, and I think that's a genuine criticism. So, although the, the figures look good in terms of the increase of, of amount of commissioning, you know, going up to the levels it is just now, it was what was set out as an ambition, and uh, that's 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 been realised. The issue is that um, is that reaching the independence in Scotland to the extent that it should do, and I think that's still an issue of concern. So, when I said that we're looking at these areas, it's as much about our relationship with the commissioners. And if you look at um, MG Alba, for example, um, they, as, and if you think about the size and, and reach of them, they are, they are, they are uh, commissioning 20% of work from the independent producers for the whole of, of the broadcasting sector, and 78% of their production is via the independents. Now, that shows what you can do with a successful, um, let's say successful independent uh, broadcasting station. It's why this parliament agreed that a digital channel would be good for the industry in terms of the, the impact it would have in terms of uh, Scottish production. And that's still a live discussion. And what I would say is, in, uh, in, in following through our involvement, and again, it's part of the Smith Commission in terms of the proposition of the... Con the, the uh, uh, consultation that should take place on the Charter Renewal will be moving very quickly after the Westminster election, I suspect, in terms of activity on the BBC Charter Renewal. And I think it, it would be helpful for, for me in my case, uh, were the committee to consider what the implications might be, because some kind of uh, push and requirement as part of the Charter Renewal to support the industry in Scotland, particularly independent production, would be a very helpful, constructive uh, proposition if we could get cross-party support on that. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about the Smith Commission, but you've, you've covered that point. Um, my final point would therefore be, um, given the difficulty that Scottish independent producers have had in um, gaining work from uh, commissioners that are based south of the border, 
Uh, many of them are targeting export markets, and I know this committee is going to be looking at um, <coughs> Scottish exports in the next couple of months. Which of the two agencies would be there to support independent television production companies to, to access these export markets? Given that Scottish Enterprise doesn't fund production, and Creative Scotland only funds Scottish content. You know, who's, well, who's going to assist these companies to access this export market in a potentially growth area? Yeah, I'll, I'll probably, I, I think it'd be helpful if Creative Scotland could respond to you in, in, in some of the, the, the former questions. I'm not sure how, how accurate some of that might be. But there's obviously, uh, also Scottish Development International have a play in terms of our international reach as well. Uh, one of the areas I think in terms of looking for funding that I'm very keen that we work on it would be Creative Scotland that would take the lead on this as well, but they would work with other agencies. Um, if you look at um, European funding, one of the few budgets that has increased is the, is the Creative Europe funding. Um, the requirement for that is to have cross uh, co-production. And but if you have a look at most of the, not most, but a significant amount of the production you'll see on, on television at the end, you'll see co-production with different countries. Now that again is the way. It's either with different companies uh, in terms of the international reach, whether it's with co-productions with American companies. But the the opportunity for Europe, in particular, whether it's working with the, the Scandinavian countries or indeed with other countries, is very important. It's why in my discussions um, with the French, I've. I've a cultural agreement um, with, the, with the French, uh, also in relation to Ireland. I think that would be an ideal co-producer in terms of access for funding in different areas. So I, I'm very active and I've asked officials to look very closely at what might be possible in relation to using the new 14 to 20 Creative Europe funding on digital media um, and film in particular. And I think there are opportunities that we can pursue um, in that regard. Also, my discussion with the Polish uh, culture minister when I was in, uh, was in Poland uh, last year, again, the areas of co collaboration and cooperation. The content has to come. The content has to come from the producers uh, and the writers, and the, we can't dictate that. But in terms of uh, funding and co-production, um, that is the way that things are going in the future anyway. I just want us to maximise that. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Free supplementary on this, is it? Uh, yeah. just on Independent production, yep. yes, uh, convener. Uh, the since yesterday's announcement on on the extra funding, it's it's generated some obviously interest, and I've had a number of of emails and and also talked to people on social media who are responding to it. And it's not that people don't welcome the fact that there'll be some extra money available, um, but they're concerned that it may not actually benefit. Uh, the parts of the industry that that need to, that the, the the independent level, at the grassroots level, where talent is found and developed. Uh, one uh, correspondent in particular cites a number of organisations who have all been unsuccessful very recently in their applications for regular funding from Creative Scotland, not on the basis of the strength of their applications or the quality of their work, but because, uh, and I'm quoting here, uh, advised that the decision not to fund was significantly informed by the fact Creative Scotland were still to map our sector, this despite a comprehensive mapping exercise of the sector being undertaken as part of the new film strategy for Scotland, published in October last year. So they want me to ask you what arrangements are going to be in place to ensure that the additional funding actually goes where it's needed at the grassroots, grassroots level where, as I say, new talent can be identified and, and, and nurtured? Okay, a couple of things there. Um, the £1 million development funding is absolutely about nurturing and developing um, the, the sector and the areas that you're talking about in terms of the emerging uh, talent. So that funding that has been announced yesterday is specifically for development of the industry, which means the the, the area you've just been talking about. In terms of the £2 million uh, loan transaction, that obviously affects is affected by the rules on tax credit and there are different rates for over productions that are over £20 mil million, which is a, obviously a large production um, and different rates for less than £20 million. In terms of um, regular funding, uh, you'll know that uh, the requests and asks of Creative Scotland far, far exceeded the funding they had available. They actually increased their pot of funding for over the, 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 the period from £90 million up to £100 uh, million. Uh, those that didn't get regular funding can apply for project funding um, and the range of the amount of that can go from 50,000 to 150,000. Larger, you know, larger amounts of money can be provided by project funding. So, How do you respond of, to the explanation that they've heard that it's about Creative I, Scotland having still to map their sector? I, I, I don't know what Does that, that I don't, sense? You know, I, that's sense? I haven't seen anything that, that reflects that, that comment. You'd have, to, you'd have to speak to Creative Scotland about that. You, you'd be worried if that was the picture. I think, I think it's an I 
th- I don't recognise that as an explanation. I think the fact that there was far bigger asks than on the, the funding that they had provided um, is the same explanation that's given to all the different sectors. In terms of regular funding, there are organisations, and I'm quite happy that, again, it would be, I'd ask Creative Scotland to supply you with those in the film. Film, film was one of the areas, as far as I recall, that actually had an increase in terms of profile, in terms of the regular funding announcement that Creative Scotland gave at the end of last year. Um, so uh, rather than saying that film work wasn't getting funding. I, my understanding is film got more funding from the regular funding announcements that Creative Scott made last year than had been done previously, but I'm happy to, to arrange for them to supply that to the committee. Well, I'll perhaps pursue that in correspondence. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, no, Kapina. Thank you. OK, um, Richard Lyle has been very patient, so I'll bring Richard in next. We have time. There's a couple more members I want to get in. I will ensure, convener, you have time. I'll, I'll do two quick questions, and I'm sure I'll get two excellent answers. Um, from Mr Swinney, can, uh, has the, go- the Scottish Government had any discussion with the UK Government about possible changes to criteria for tax incentives for creative industries, for example, in introducing a requirement and to employ local Scotland-based technical talent in order to qualify? Um, We've not had as specific a discussion on that point, but we have certainly um, been in dialogue with the United Kingdom government about uh, the use of the tax system to incentivise the um, development of particular parts of the sector, particularly the computer game sector, which has been a major part of correspondence that has been, um, you know, which we've been pursuing the United Kingdom government to put in place the mechanisms that we think would enable the computer games industry to thrive uh, to a much greater extent within Scotland. So, uh, yes, there have been uh, exchanges with the UK government on that issue in general, but not as specific a point as Mr Lyle uh, raised with me. OK. Uh, and to the Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Um, like Patrick Harvey and others, we've had uh, many emails from constituents in regard to what they say, and, and with the greatest respect and I say it to the, 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 the Creative Scotland last week, the shambles that they feel that Creative Scotland is in. Now that you've heard what you've heard and, and the commitments you've given today and what you've, you've uh, uh, listened to the, the members of the committee, do you intend to sit down with Creative Scotland as soon as possible in order to address the concerns that people say that the problem they have uh, with Creative Scotland? Well, I would also refer to the meetings that um, uh, John Swain and I att- uh, attended with the Independent Producers of Scotland that were attended by Creative Scotland uh, colleagues as well. So they've heard directly about what the concerns are. Now, I wouldn't describe it in the way that you have. I, I do think that we could, uh, you know, we-, we could improve things. But remember, you know, Creative Scotland have to say no to more people than say yes in relation to funding. Right? And that- that's uncomfortable. That's uncomfortable. That's difficult. Um, it's not necessarily, as Patrick Harry said, because of the talent and capability and there's really good applications that go to Creative Scotland. But if you've got far more good applications uh, coming forward than you have resources, then you're going to disappoint people. And that disappointment can be expressed in different, in, in different ways. But as far as the relationship, I think your core of your question is um, the importance of the relationship between the organisations. Is that important? Yes, absolutely. Do they know it's important? Yes, they do. Um, but I think it, part of this is born out of frustration. Frustration because people know the opportunities that we have are really, really strong. We've got great, talented, skilled people in the film sector um, and we want to support them. So it's, it's, a, you know, it's a frustration, but it's, it's not because the, the market isn't there, not that we're, we're capable of delivering. We are, and we just need to scale up more of what we're doing and we're perfectly conscious that that's the, the requirement and that's what they ask us. No, th- just to correct you, I'm not saying it's a shambles. Uh, my one of my constituents who works in the industry is saying it's well, a shambles. Yeah. But I, I take You've it with, to, from yeah. a, a simple yes or no. Uh, would you do you intend to sit down and, I, I, with Creative Scotland and and all other parties to try and sort this supposed shambles? Well, I. I, I I don't describe it in the terms that you have, and I don't recognise those terms. What I do recognise is that there's a need to make sure that we continually improve relations, not just with the agencies themselves, but also with the sector. And that's what we'll do. And also, uh, I will be making sure that the report from this committee is something that's discussed by all the agencies. Because, you know, as I said right at the start, I really welcome the committee shining a spotlight on this sector because it's one that Scotland, by and large, at political level, has has not had the attention that I, I perhaps would have wanted it to see from the Parliament as a whole. So I, I welcome your report. 
Thank you. No, can I just add? And, Kavira, to, to what the Cabinet Secretary said, yeah, I think that this... I, I, I've taken part in a number of, of these meetings and I, I've, not, uh, I've not been involved in conversations that I would right. could in any way be described in the, the fashion that Mr Lyle's constituent has suggested. Uh, what, what I unreservedly accept is that agencies must work effectively together and certainly I'm very happy to confirm that that is the, uh, the approach that the government takes to encourage that to be the case and obviously we'll look carefully at what the committee um, concludes on this matter to make sure that uh, we are able to fulfil that commitment to, 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 to Parliament. Thank you. Right. Um, Patrick Harvey. Uh, you were going to ask about the game sector? Um, I think the issues that I'd been meaning to ask about the game sector did come up earlier. Okay. Uh, in that case, Dennis Roberts. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll stick to the um, computer and gaming. Um, Brian Baglow, in his evidence to the committee, was suggesting that the, the industry itself has a, a distinct lack of knowledge, you know, in, in terms of a, um, marketing, um, uh, accounting. Uh, although they've got the ideas of, of the, the computer games and the concepts and all that sort of thing. Um, how, how can we actually assist the gaming industry to be more uh, to, to give them the, the, the information they need to be successful entrepreneurs. Obviously, because we're, we're developing our economic growth and we're, we're looking at the sort of wider aspects of trying to retain our talent here as well rather than seeing a, a drain of our talent going abroad. So how do we get them to sort of step up and be that sort of creative business? They've got the idea, but they haven't got the business uh, uh, knowledge. I, I, think, I, I, don't think, I don't think this is... Um, a particularly unique no. issue for the <laughs> computer game sector. You know, we've got um, you know we've got universities that are crammed full of absolutely fantastic researchers and innovators, but I wouldn't ask them to run a business because it requires a different skill. They're absolutely fantastic at creating new concepts and products, but running a business is a completely different proposition. So, a uh, key thing is that we ensure that the correct and appropriate advice is available to individuals to support them in that uh, in that journey and to make sure that the, the correct collaborations are put together because there may be, um, the, the, way, the way through this may well be collaborations between people who are adept at running businesses and people who are adept at developing computer games and they may be two very different types of individuals. But, you know, I don't think we should let this question obscure the fact that we've got a number of absolutely fantastic computer games companies that have demonstrated not only good concepts and good ideas, but phenomenally successful commercial products of which we should be enormously proud. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, I have two more members want to come in if they're, if they're brief and we get brief responses, we should manage that. Uh, Chick Rooney. Thank you, it, When we talk about the opportunities, we agree that, that certainly in the in, in gaming industry, there are huge opportunities, um, but they require investment, uh, and the opportunities that can be capitalised on that investment are clearly worldwide. What do you think Creative Scotland should be doing uh, to promote creative industries abroad? I mean, when we were talking about crafts, for example, we, we heard about people going to exhibitions in New York, carrying their products in their, in their baggage, which doesn't seem to me to be the professional, you know, image or brand that we want to give uh, Scotland. So how do we, how do you think uh, Creative Scotland should be promoting mm. our creative industries abroad? Well, working again with um, SDI and appropriate mm -hmm. agencies there, um, in terms of um, the reach, uh, again, you know, part of that is also looking at the network. Uh, I'm reflecting on your comment that when I was in San Francisco meeting with a number of the, the gaming companies there, some of them run by very successful Scots, very keen to help mentor and support or kind of introduce those from elsewhere. In terms of um, some of that um, technology, in terms of, again, the switch over from film and, and digital, at Pixar, for example, we've got the director from there working with Glasgow School of Art directly. Um, obviously, you're getting new emerging businesses as, as, as they develop in, in terms of that exposure. Uh, we are recognised internationally um, as a, a centre for creative industries. I spoke at a European Council meeting, an informal council in Barcelona, uh, when explaining again, you know, if you think about Rockstar, Grand Theft Auto, you know, the take that they had, biggest, you know, the fastest selling entertainment product of all time comes from comes from Scotland. Uh, and, and that recognition is there and that reach. If you look at Minecraft, you know, any of you, and I think... The convener has uh, children of similar age as mine. 
been a, a, a fantastic development that's been uh, produced and again the educational opportunities so uh, I, I think we're in a very strong place I think the inter international marketing is fine it's obviously about the industry itself but obviously there's a kind of calling card of that um, recognition um, is important but that's an international promotion as you would have um, in any other industry that's what would happen and that's where you know it's not just about working with skills development Scotland funding council Highlands and Islands Enterprise Scottish Enterprise but also SDI in this area as well. Yep. And lastly, Liz Thank very much. And briefly to come back to where we started with the tax credit loan fund and the question of accessing tax credits early in a, a cash flow uh, proposition, as Mr. Sweeney said, clearly welcome in itself. One, one, one of the uh, points that I've um, uh, gathered this morning is that already producers are able to access loans against their impending tax credits elsewhere on the market. So will this loan facility be at more favourable terms or how, how will it actually add to the options available to producers who currently can borrow against impending tax credits elsewhere? Go right. uh, we, are, we are back in session. Yep. Mr. Swinney, you can... I'm sorry, start again. Oh, no, 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 no
Okay, if we can uh, reconvene, uh, we're now at uh, item two on the agenda, and the committee is taking evidence on uh, legislative uh, consent motion LCM uh, uh, bracket S4 close bracket 31.2 on the Small Business Enterprise and Employment Bill UK Parliament legislation. I'd like to welcome uh, Fergus Ewing, Minister for Business, Energy and Tourism, and Vicky Verrill, who is Head of Structure and Capacity of Government uh, at the Scottish Government. Uh, Welcome to you uh, both. Uh, Minister, would you like to uh, introduce this uh, LCM, please? Yes, thank you, uh, Convener. I'm grateful for the chance to address the committee on the supplementary memoran memorandum lodged by the Deputy First Minister on the 13th of January. The committee considered the wider devolved aspects of the UK Government's Small Business Enterprise and Employment Bill at its meeting on the 8th of October last year and noted that a supplementary LCM on the provisions on public sector exit payments might be brought forward subject to Scottish and UK governments reaching agreement on the policy. Following the committee's earlier consideration, the two governments reached agreement that, in the interests of securing value for taxpayers' money and of public sector labour, mo labour market mobility, the exit market uh, payment provisions should apply to senior staff movements within similar parts of the public sector across the UK. The Deputy First Minister agreed with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury to progress a supplementary LCM on the understanding that the provisions as originally in the bill would be amended to confer powers on Scottish ministers in relation to relevant devolved bodies. The Chief Secretary agreed to that on 5th November. Appropriate amendments to the bill were tabled on 7th January for consideration in Lord's Committee. Those amendments were agreed on 26th January. The bill as amended is expected to go to Lord's Report in March. The supplementary memorandum outlined the relevant amendments to the bill, which cover four related substantive measures and one minor consequential change. In essence, the bill as amended provides for Scottish ministers rather than the Treasury to make regulations on qualifying exit payments made by devolved public bodies with devolved workforces. Those regulations will be able to include certain provisions, for example, on exemptions from a repayment and on duties to ensure that repayments are made. The bill also provides for Scottish ministers, not the Treasury, to waive or give consent to waive repayments of exit payments made by devolved bodies. And it provides for regulations, whether made by the Treasury or Scottish ministers, to be made by negative procedure. Uh, this is on the grounds that the regulations themselves are likely to need frequent updating and because they will not be used to amend primary, primary legislation or to create offences. While the memorandum covered the amendments as tabled and subsequently passed in the Lords, the Committee will wish to know that the Treasury have just notified us that they expect to bring forward further clarifying amendments at report stage. These will make explicit that the purpose of the provisions is to recover qualifying exit payments from individuals who return to work within a year of leaving. This reflects the underlying policy position and therefore has the Scottish Government's support. The amendments to the bill and the further clarifications that are proposed will give effect to the agreement reached between Scottish and UK ministers in a way that allows Scottish Government and Parliament to determine the detail of future Scottish regulations, including which devolved bodies to include within scope. The Scottish Government is rigorous in its pursuit of value for money across the public sector. Audit Scotland and the Accounts Commission produced a report in 2013 into early departures from the public sector, including local government, recommending controls over the re-employment within the same body of individuals who receive early departure deals. That approach was supported by the Public Audit Committee. The measures provided for in the Bill more than respond to that recommendation, extending as they do to re-employment within a similar part of the public sector and, Convener, I therefore ask the Committee to support the draft legislative consent motion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, I, I know members at one or two points. Maybe just I could just start off by asking a general point around the policy here. I mean, I think we've all been familiar over the years with situations where um, highly paid people, and this only applies to people earning more than £100,000 a year, in the public sector have, have left, but then have found themselves re-engaged not as employees, but on a contract basis where they become consultants and, and, and uh, you know, earn large sums of public money on, on a contract basis. So will th these measures only apply to those directly employed or will they impact on those who are contractors? 
Um, well, generally those individuals who receive exit payments from the public sector and then return off payroll to the to the same or similar role, for example, as a contractor, are included within the scope of the proposals. However, except that in some instances, individuals that leave may continue to have a limited form of engagement with the public sector. For example, where an individual is employed by a large consultancy firm, in those instances, a uh, convener, it would be an unfair restriction of trade and probably impose a disproportionate level of complexity and costs to recover exit uh, payments. So the regulations under the relevant provisions of the bill would therefore seek to differentiate between these two groups and there would be further consultation on a proposed definition as part of the regulations. In the meantime, the relevant clauses of the bill make a general provision that the future regulations may provide for exit payment to be repaid within a prescribed period where an individual in receipt of such a payment becomes uh, an employee or a contractor of a prescribed public sector authority or a holder of a prescribed public sector office. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, Chick Brown? Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, in looking at this one question, it's why people would make decisions knowing that they might have to employ somebody and bring them back, make the decision in the first place in terms of... of a, allowing them to go or releasing them, um, but of course there are different conditions. I wonder if I might uh, uh, refer to uh, clauses eight, 8 and 9 in terms of the salary limitation. And I know that there are certain conditions in terms of uh, jobs here where um, they're attached to, as is indicated, the, the, the Treasury in, 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 in uh, London. But surely, because there are salary, salary differentials uh, and, and the general gradation of, of salaries are different uh, between uh, London and, and here, um, isn't it a case, Minister, for creating a separate Scottish level to ensure that we capture as many of these uh, people who are allowed to leave, do leave, uh, etc. You don't think that should be, the hundred thousand pound limit should be reduced? Well, I think we wanted to ensure a, a consistency of approach and, and fair treatment of relevant individuals within the public sector in Scotland, but also uh, a, across border as well. A um, hundred thousand pounds is a fairly handsome salary wherever one is based, and no doubt there are different standards and cost of living within different parts of the country, although in London the difference is perhaps most marked. So uh, I think we didn't want to make this too complicated. We thought that the, the principle of, of having a regulation over exit payments was correct. Audit Scotland, the Audit Commission, uh, uh, and indeed the um, Audit Committee of this Parliament all recommended that regulations were necessary particularly in the light of some well-publicised individual cases, which I do not propose to rehash here. Uh, and we thought, broadly speaking, that the, the policy approach, uh, that when one retires, one retires, and doesn't, don't immediately come back the next day and carry on as is, having received a large exit payment, that regulation is necessary to deal with that. Uh, no doubt that, that no policy is, no legal approach is perfect in this regard, convener, but we felt that a consistency of approach of treatment was, broadly speaking, the correct approach uh, to take. Obviously, there are some salary differentials for commensurate senior public sector jobs north and south of the border. There are a number of individual posts in Scotland attracting salaries above the proposed 100,000 threshold. Um, for your interest, for example, over 60 directors, chief executive posts in NHS Scotland, five chief executives of devolved Scottish public corporations, 14 chief executives of devolved Scottish executive NDPBs and over 100 senior level posts across Scottish local authorities. So there are uh, a great many people in leadership roles in the public sector in Scotland who are earning more than £100,000, which is a, a pretty handsome salary by anyone's uh, reckoning. Okay, Mr Harvey. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Minister. Um, I don't claim to have a great deal of sympathy for those who might lose out as a result of this kind of uh, mechanism. Uh, I think very few people would. But the, the purpose of this, the, the policy objective of it, which you say the Scottish Government agrees, is clearly not to tackle 
unequal pay and the, the problem of high pay in our society. If it was, I'd say it was long overdue, but that's clearly not the objective here. Is there a reason in principle why uh, the arrangements for compensating for people for loss of employment should be different in the public than the private sector? Um, well, I, I mean, I think the, the policy intention behind the regulation of exit payments is, is quite narrowly defined, and as Mr Harvey quite rightly says, convener, that is, is not really a matter of addressing equality. I mean, it's addressing particular cases where the public are concerned that, uh, that those who, who are in leadership roles retire and then the next day carry on as is in a different arrangement, having received a very large payout. I mean, that is the issue of, of public concern. And I think the approach has been on both sides of the, of the border in a principled fashion, but also a proportionate fashion. Uh, I, the question Mr Harvey raises is really a somewhat different matter of policy, which is should public and private sector uh, compensation payments be treated differently? Um, I mean, I think that public sector and private sector are, are in, in essence, somewhat different uh, for a large number of reasons. Uh, and therefore, uh, it would be difficult to equiparate the treatment of compensation payments uh, on public and private sector basis. For example, uh, conditions in relation to security of tenure in the public sector are different from those in the private sector. Uh, and the, the public sector also has, I think, in general terms, convener, although we're straying perhaps off piste in relation to this, uh, the public sector does have defined uh, pension salary arrangements, and increasingly that in the private sector is a rara avis. So it is impossible, I think, to <laughs> equiparate the public <laughs> and private sector. Um, and therefore, interesting though Mr Harvey's question is, perhaps it would be one for consideration perfectly legitimate consideration on another day. I, I, I enjoyed the, the term there. Um, the, 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 the point is that this mechanism is intended to deal with one particular specific kind of abuse. And we know that the same kind of abuse happens in the private sector uh, in, in many cases uh, in terms of much greater sums of money. Why isn't that a problem? Well, we... In law, we tend to deal with specific situations and principles and uh, then turn to other matters if they require legislation at a later date. Uh, I mean, if it's of any a, a consolation to Mr Harvey, you know, I do share concerns about the sizes of bonus payments, for example, that uh, some bankers have received, and I've said so in the Chamber and on many other occasions, and I think that's something that the public uh, quite widely perceive as a difficulty the power in relation to those particular matters do rest, of course, convener, as you know, with the UK government. And it's the UK government that has declined, perhaps, for reasons that, uh, uh, that uh, they, they can perhaps explain to deal with that particular matter. But uh, this is beyond scope. We are a way off piece, a uh, convener. And perhaps the best thing to do when one is a way off piece is to return to base, which I now do. <laughs> do the, uh, onto the piece, yes, I think so. I'm okay. happy to leave it at okay. a weak criticism of the UK government convener. I'm sure we can all agree on that. <laughs> I'm sure in his heart of heart, even the minister doesn't share that view. But uh, I'll bring in uh, Joanne Lambert. Mm. I, mean, I think there's an interesting debate to be had about the level of pay that you're actually finding in the public sector, as you read out there. I think some people might be quite surprised the extent to the number of people who are paid over that amount, and there is a general concern why are public bodies getting rid of somebody's, um, taking them off the payroll and then bringing them back, and it must be because in terms of the pressures and funding, they find it a way that still makes sense to them. I think the graver concern to us would be the number of people who are low paid in the public sector who find themselves externalised and even then don't get, for example, a living wage, but even though they've got a contract that's funded by uh, government or public sector, but that's for, for, um, is also for another day, I expect. What I wanted specifically to ask you about is um, you defined, and you said you'll look at this further um, following the, the convenience question, that an individual person coming back as a consultant would be penalised. But however, if they were part of a consultancy firm, they wouldn't be. 
So we would create an incentive for all of these people just to get themselves together in one big group, define themselves as a company and with equal shares, presumably, and then none of them would have to pay their money back. They could even lob in a wee bit of the money that they're uh, not having to pay back into supporting the creation of this company. I mean, at what, uh, have you got firm proposals on how you would deal with that? If the message is to people and to public bodies, stop playing about with public funding because people are offended by it, how are you going to address that, that possibility? OK. I mean, I, as I understand um, Joanne uh, Lamont's question, it uh, really uh, asks how we are going to set out in the regulations provisions which would avoid, which would prevent a, a kind of avoidance efforts, mechanisms set up in order to avoid triggering repayment of the exit uh, payment by the use of consultancy firms. I think that's a perfectly fair and reasonable point to make, and it's one which I shall uh, uh, reflect upon uh, uh, when we come to the stage of making the regulations. Uh, plainly, the regulations are intended to deal with a particular mischief, as legislation uh, often has as its purpose, uh, and therefore it is incumbent on us to think of what steps may be taken by clever individuals with smart advisors to circumvent these regulations. So I think it's a perfectly fair point, and it's one which I undertake uh, that uh, consideration will be given to in the course of drafting the regulations convener, particularly since both yourself and a member of your committee have uh, made the, the same or similar points. Thank you. Well, what one would hope anybody earning more than £100,000 a year in the public sector would be clever. Well, they could afford clever advisors, lawyers. <laughs> well, uh, I hope, well the two are not, hope the two are not mutually exclusive. Um, OK, um, Richard Lyle and then Chick Brody. Just, uh, just a quick question. Uh, you, you've detailed there are over 100 uh, people in, in Scottish local authorities. I think you'll find that, uh, um, you know, whilst you don't have an exact figure, I, I would say it might be approaching 150 to 200. But... Um, just to remind me, and uh, maybe I missed it, will the powers be con conferred on Scottish ministers apply to the S SPCB and office holders, Audit General, Audit Scotland, etc.? Um, yes, the, uh, the provisions uh, will apply to the SPCB and its office holders, and we are in discussion with the Treasury and BIS about possible further amendments to the bill if necessary to make that absolutely clear, the Deputy First Minister wrote to the presiding officer on the inclusion of the SPCB in the bill's provisions on the 18th of December. The presiding officer replied on the 22nd of December, raising no objection uh, to that. So uh, this uh, will therefore be applied to the SPCB as well. Thank you. That was my question. Okay, can I just ask one technical question then, if nobody else has any other points to make? Um, the Delegated Powers and uh, Law Reform Committee, in their report uh, to this committee, um, were uh, unclear why the powers conferred on Scottish ministers should be subject to negative procedure rather than affirmative. I wondered, Minister, if you could just explain why the Scottish Government took the view that it should be a negative procedure. Uh, well, we, we, we gave a, a lot of thought to this, and we noted the views of some members, including John Mason, that this merited the, the affirmative procedure. On the other hand, other members, such as Stuart Stevenson, expressed the view that since the uh, regulations would not involve uh, amendments to or, 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 or principles of primary legislation or creation of offences, that negative procedure would be appropriate. In addition to that, it is likely, convener, that there will be several regulations. There will be a deal of regulations, many of them dealing with specific public bodies and or will largely, we suspect, anticipate, be of a largely technical nature. It would be unduly cumbers cumbersome and inappropriate, we believe, to use affirmative procedure in those circumstances. Uh, and therefore, after having, having given it careful thought and uh, including consideration by myself, it was decided that uh, negative uh, procedure would be appropriate in these circumstances. Okay, thank you. Okay, if no one else has any other questions to put to the Minister, in that case, I would uh, ask the committee whether we are uh, content to uh, recommend to Parliament that it gives consent to the relevant provisions of the Small Business 
Enterprise Unemployment Bill as set out in the supplementary LCM. Is that the view of the committee? It is, thank you. And can I ask if the committee are content to delegate to the convener and clerk the production of a short factual report detailing the committee's considerations and arranging for its publication? That is agreed. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. We'll now have a very short suspension to allow a changeover of your officials. I mean, we're now on uh, item uh, three, uh, and the committee is taking evidence on the Scottish Regulator's Strategic um, uh, Code of Practice. And I'd like to uh, welcome back the Minister, and he's joined on this occasion by uh, Sandra Reid, who's Better Regulation Policy Manager, and Marion McCormack, who is Head of Enterprise Sponsorship and Better Regulation from the uh, Scottish Government. Uh, Minister, do you want to introduce this uh, item? Okay, thank you, Convener. Uh, I'm pleased to return to discuss the Scottish Regulator's Strategic Code of Practice. When I appeared in front of you to speak about the Code in December, I gave a commitment to revisit the Code in the light of concerns which had been raised by the DPLR Committee, particularly comments regarding a potential inconsistency between the Parliament's intentions for the Code and the wording in the Code itself. It is critical the Code accurately reflects the intentions of the Act and Parliament's expectations, and that is why I withdrew the original Code. Careful consideration has been given to the comments raised and the wording reviewed and revised accordingly. During this process, we also took the opportunity to consider concerns SCDI raised in their letter submitted to the committee in November and have made a further reference to innovation within the code. We consulted on the proposed changes with the members of the short-term working group which developed the code and they are broadly content. As a result of this, I now consider the code before you more accurately reflects the true intentions of the Regulatory Reform Act. Uh, as I explained in December, the Scottish Regulator's Strategic Code of Practice sets out to encourage and support regulators in applying regulatory principles and building good practice in order to contribute to achieving sustainable economic growth, whilst concurrently delivering other core functions. Many regulators already contribute to sustainable economic growth in their day-to-day -day activities, and continue to make progress on this, moving towards an enabling outcomes-based approach to drive further performance improvements and carrying out regular activities, regulatory activities in a way that helps business. The code builds on the existing good practice, providing greater transparency and clarifying for regulators what is expected of them and for business what they can expect from regulators. The code enhances and strengthens our existing better regulation toolkit to deliver better and effective regulation. It provides a clear framework for regulators to ensure that their regulatory functions are transparent, proportionate, accountable, consistent and targeted. Alongside the duty to contribute to achieving sustainable economic growth, this will also play an important role in making Scotland a more successful country with an attractive business environment providing opportunities for all. Before I move the motion recommending the committee approve the Scottish Regulators' Code of Practice, I would be happy to seek to answer any questions that the committee has. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Does anybody have any questions they wish to raise? Patrick Harvey? Thank you. Um, the, um, some of the, the responses to the original consultation uh, on the, the first draft of the Code uh, expressed some, uh, some concern that for example, the definition of sustainable economic growth uh, could be tightened and some specific suggestions were made on how that could be done, uh, but did actually welcome uh, one aspect in paragraph 9, which made it clear that the um, regulators to which the code applies must take the code into account uh, in developing policies or principles, uh, but not in the uh, application of uh, individual cases, the exercise of regulatory functions in individual cases. But the, um, the new version of the code, if I can just switch from one screen to the other, seems to have ignored both those comments. It seems to have 
done nothing to improve or tighten up the definition of sustainable economic growth, which has been a, a long-standing concern. But it seems actually to go in the opposite direction on paragraph 9 and uh, apply to, in, in subsection A of that, determining policies and principles, uh, but B, in exercising regulatory functions. That seems to imply uh, a significant change uh, in terms of the uh, question of individual cases. Is that the intention of those changes? Um, well, I, I think it's true to say that considerable uh, attention and scrutiny was given, as Mr Harvey knows, uh, to the definition of sustainable economic growth. And the introduction and background to the Code includes, um, for the record, convener, the following definition of sustainable economic growth. Uh, sustainable economic growth means building a dynamic and growing economy that will provide prosperity and opportunities for all, whilst ensuring that future generations can enjoy a better quality of life too. Um, the majority of the respondents were supportive of the purpose and intent of the Code, uh, and adjustments were made to reflect comments received during the consultation. But I think it is fair to point out, to uh, convener, that the adjustments that were considering today were made at the specific behest of the DPLR committee, who quite rightly drew attention to what appeared to be an inadvertent uh, apparent contradiction between the code and the legislation. It would have served no one to have a code which contained an inherent contradiction of the terms of the Act which Parliament passed. Uh, uh, and therefore, uh, I think it is correct that uh, the amendments to the code have been made. Uh, it may be that Mr Harvey and I still disagree, perhaps, on some of the, the larger policy questions, but we are here not to re-debate re the terms of the, of the Act, which is now law. We are here to implement that Act and deliver a code which allows it to be debated in practice. I mean, let me just say, as, as a matter of, sort of, of, of practice and um, how matters uh, are dealt with by various regulators, at least from my perspective, that generally speaking, there, there is a, a, a very positive uh, approach of regulators, such as SEPA, for example, to the discharge of their functions. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that is increasingly being recognised by many businesses with whom I deal, not most recently by the Civil Engineers Contractors Association, with whom I met recently, who singled out SEPA for being a regulator who appeared to work with uh, members of the uh, civil engineers and the discharge of their duties. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the, there are many examples of regulators who are already espousing good practice, but it's entirely right that both in principle and in practice the legislation should be implemented as Parliament intended. And I believe now, convener, that uh, this amended code, which, as I say, deals with the specific points put forward by the DPLR committee, does precisely that. We, we do certainly disagree on the, the legislation and we, we disagree on the question of whether the concept of sustainable economic growth actually means anything. But I'm, I'm not trying to explore that again. I'm trying to get a, a, a specific answer to the change uh, in Section 9. The earlier draft clearly, explicitly did not apply to the exercise of uh, individ functions in, regulatory functions in individual cases. The new paragraph 9 seems to reverse that. Is that a correct interpretation? The original code did not reflect the, the meaning and intent of Parliament. The new code does. And in that respect, uh, a, 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 I believe the amended code is correct. Uh, and it is correct in the sense that it will apply to the way that the regulators carry out all of their functions. Uh, and I'm, I understand that, broadly speaking, the members of the working group who we consulted, convener, on these changes, we deliberately decided to go back to the working group to raise this matter afresh with them, and they are broadly content with that, as we understand it. I think that's about as clear as it's going to get. OK, thank you. Any other points somebody wants to yeah. make? Uh, I, I would just note, Minister, I remember when you came to the committee in, in December raising the issue that had been raised um, uh, with us by SCDI about the, the lack of reference to innovation. I'm, I'm pleased to see that's now been, been included, so that's, that's positive. And I also note that uh, their uh, stakeholders who uh, commented on the previous version of the draft code uh, were alerted when the revised code was laid but have raised uh, no points in relation uh, to it. 
Okay, if there are no further questions, we'll move on to uh, item uh, four on the agenda, which is the uh, debate. Minister, I invite you to move motion uh, S4M12158 that the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee recommends that the Scottish Regulator's Strategic Code of Practice be approved. Formally moved. No, I've not put the question yet, Mr Brody. <laughs> uh, it's moved. moved. Do any members wish to speak in this debate? Mr Harvey. Arguments that were advanced uh, both during the consideration of the legislation and in the discussion a few minutes ago with the Minister, uh, and I will be opposing the, the, the decision on this code. Okay, thank you. Any other members wish to speak? Minister, do you wish to respond? Uh, just to, to repeat that I believe that the amended code now reflects the terms of the legislation, and I think this, if I may say so, convener, is an example, a very good example of how valuable parliamentary scrutiny can be, that it is because of the efforts and the diligence uh, of Nigel Don and his committee members in DPLR that we were able to detect and correct what was a manifest error in the code and which has now been corrected. So uh, I think this is a, a good example of parliamentary scrutiny and the efficacy and diligence of committee members in this parliament. Thank you, Minister. Um, okay, um, I will uh, now put the question. The question is that a motion S4M12158 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will now be a vote. Those in favour of that motion, please show. One, two, three, four. That's eight. Those against the motion, please show. One. Uh, so that motion is therefore uh, carried. And. Right, okay, and I can now uh, thank uh, the Minister for your attendance and for your officials. Thank you for coming. We'll now have a very short suspension just to allow you to, to leave. We can uh, reconvene. We're now on item five, uh, European priorities. Just to remind members we are still in public session. Uh, we have a paper before us on uh, our European priorities for 2015, which you've all had a chance to look at. Um, as you'll know, Chick Brody is our European uh, reporter, uh, so I just ask Chick if there's anything he wants to add uh, in relation to the written paper we have. Nothing major. I, I'd like to thank the clerk for, for, for the discussion we had uh, in the prep and preparation of the paper. Uh, clearly the EERC, the, the European External uh, Relations Committee, are uh, looking for the uh, input to their establishment of what the priorities of the Parliament should be. Uh, the three areas that, we're, uh, that we, yeah, I'm recommending is, is, is clearly the TTIP, the, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership uh, proposals are, are you know, gathering pace or heat or whatever application, but clearly it has, pardon? <laughs> the wheels? <laughs> I, th I think, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's well, the EERC are of course looking at this, but I think it's important from, a, from an economy point of view that uh, uh, we certainly, uh, as proposed, keep a watching brief, but at some stage once we, uh, we, without the wheels coming off, as we get uh, more information that we may want to do further investigation as the implications for the Scottish economy. Sure. The, the second thing is, is, as we know, that we've uh, and for Mr Norman Kerr here more often than some of the committee members in terms of, of fuel poverty and energy efficiency. So one of the uh, things, that, again, that we need to address, which is the, the energy union strategy, is being tabled next month uh, and includes you know, energy security, carbon emissions, you know, decarbonisation. And again, I think that's an important area for us given the, the, the investigations that we've done and no doubt we'll return to. Uh, and the third area is the tourism industry. Um, we had the, the 
uh, Cabinet Secretary for, for, for Culture uh, mentioned the meeting that she attended. Um, and yeah, I think the, the, the European tourism industry are going to look at you know, how we can connect, communicate with the culture and creative sector. So that, again, that's very appropriate given uh, the discussions that we've had over the last few weeks uh, and look at the, the support and the training and skills required to support that. So these are the, uh, what I recommend is the three submissions to the EERC and I would welcome your support. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brody. So, um, three issues identified, the TTIP, uh, the uh, European Union uh, strategy on energy and the European tourism industry. Happy to hear any views anyone may have on this, or are we happy just to agree, Lewis MacDonald? I agree with the proposition. Yeah. I think our TTIP is clearly a major concern in, uh, uh, at the moment, and previous experience of European Union interest in energy has caused some issues in the past, so keeping an eye on it in the future, I think, makes sense. Thank you. Patrick? I certainly agree with the three themes that have been set out. Um, I think the, uh, the, the, the concerns around TTIP uh, continue to grow, and actually there's, there's substantial uh, growth in the political opposition to some of the most dangerous aspects of, of TTIP at the moment, and I, I think there's, um, there's a, a need for us to, to keep an eye on that. I would just say that I think if we're going to, to look at it at all, it should uh, go beyond the, the three uh, areas that are mentioned, competition, technical barriers to trade and SMEs, uh, a lot of the concern around the implications of TTIP uh, go way beyond those, those three areas and into a whole host of the, uh, the economic priorities of the, of the Scottish Government. Uh, whether we agree or disagree with the way those priorities are framed, uh, a great many of them, including some of the, uh, for example, social solidarity targets that, that are part of the National Performance Framework, uh, are threatened by by some of the implications of TTIP as well. So I would I would want to broaden it out beyond those three okay. themes. Okay, okay. Anybody else want to comment? If not, I think we can take it that uh, we we agree with the thrust of that paper. Thank you, Mr. Brody, and we'll take that forward in 2015. Okay. At that point, we will now move into private session.